and welcome to our emotional trauma and healing chat number 10. Hello. Hello, Sergio. How are, How you? are you guys? Good, good. How are you? And Inka, welcome. Hey, How are you? Good evening. Good afternoon. Wonderful to see you back on our 10th chat. Amazing. And say you just vanished. Okay, we'll wait for him to come back. Just checking if our Facebook Live runs. Yeah, I uh, I was doing the same as well, actually. Trying to trying to share it before we start. Um, I think that might be the best way. But hold on. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna share it as well. So how are you guys? How are you, Inka? It's good to see you. So we are live on Facebook. We already got our first command com comment. So um, thank you, Robert. So good to go. Save you. Well, let's let's get started, shall we? Um, yes. I've I've had a I've had a very uh, um, charged couple of weeks. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity to kind of go from there to feed from there some ideas that I've I've had um, from a lot of things I read, a lot of questions I've had. Um, and you know, from a from a trauma perspective, there are so many emotions that we have, and there are some that are more accepted. Um, there are some that are more um, understood. And in the context of our, our cultures, um, whether it's a Western culture or other cultures, um, there are some that are more accepted and less accepted in how we express them. Um, I think there's a very interesting paradox in the sense that anger seems to be one of the most um, accepted, but at the same time, um, an emotion that is not necessarily appreciated. So we see anger as an emotion that males tend to use a lot to express themselves for lack of, you know, as opposed to sadness or other emotions. Um, but I also noticed that in terms of trauma, anger is an emotion that is hard to hold. It's uh, an emotion that's hard to process and it can become something that is, um, it just continues. It continues to, to become a mechanism that you use a lot, but it doesn't necessarily heal. So I would love to hear more about your perspective from a from a healing perspective and, and your thoughts on on anger. And if you guys see it the same way, and would love to just hear your insights on that. Any thoughts? Well, it's it's a little bit difficult uh, say, to, to start this because of course, uh, so from our society we have certain emotions which have been accepted and which are typical or stereotypical for male and female and, and so on but um, just because it has been accepted and just because we have been living with it doesn't necessarily need to be the reason why it's why it's helpful okay mm -hmm. so um as we pointed out i think in the in all the nine before episode, um, whenever we do not feel calm, peaceful, and emotionally light, there is some sort of trauma, at least from right. our philosophy, um, active. And and what we do within trauma usually is something like we are avoiding, we are overcompensating, or we are just surrendering to the trauma, and we are just doing some certain certain um, actions, certain schemas, certain patterns that. Um, we learned from our childhood days which help us okay so perhaps a person a man who's angry learned to to stamp his foot or take a uh, punch the wall or something and then things look a little bit better and then um then he continues but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is a helpful um, uh, behavior that he it, it's better than beating somebody up of course but it's not a helpful behavior for him because he's not processing his emotions and he's not healing um what's what's uh what's the injured inside of him 
So um, I think it's it's really difficult to to mix mix uh, mix uh, cultural expectations. So that's what our clients obviously um, see every day. Um, to mix them with um, with the philosophy of what we use to diagnose and to to help uh, clients to overcome. Inka, what do you think about that? Well, um, generally, if you look at it from the gender perspective, it's actually that, like Je said, you said that anger is more accepted in, in males than, for example, sadness or grief. So actually it tends to be a secondary emotion that covers up what's underneath. Okay. And men and women do the opposite. So for them, it's more acceptable to be sad than angry. Mm -hmm. So they cover up their anger often with, with other emotions as well. Um, that's, okay. that's one thing. Then from a therapeutic perspective, I could also um, mention that if somebody is stuck in, in anger, and basically that's the only emotion that um, somebody is able to react with. Yes, whatever mm -hmm. comes up, the only emotion is some form of anger, being pissed off, being annoyed and so forth. We've also noticed that that um, boils down to a particular damage in the primary cell, which mm -hmm. has to do with one of the chakras. And um, of course we offer a way how to deal with that. I think if, if you look up in uh, Dr. Grant McFetridge's books, it's also mentioned there. So you're saying that there are people who can only express anger. That is the main thing they can, they can sense. Um, yeah, generally there, there is a, if there is a particular problem present, um, like a certain damage in, in one of the chakras, mm -hmm. then the person reacts only with one type of emotion. And that could be anger or it could be sadness, grief, or, you know, any other emotion, but, their, their spectrum of the emotional variety is kind of like stuck in one corner, yeah? Okay. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Um, I kind of want to ask something really quick that's not related to anger per se, mm -hmm. but from a biological perspective and a psychological perspective, how do you guys explain this a primarily Eastern philosophy of chakras that if you were to talk about it from a layman you know layman's perspective you would just get people rolling their eyes or a lot of people saying like what are you talking about chakras like what this is this these are kind of like taking from different perspectives of what we know in terms of you know what we when we talk about energies and when we talk about um we're talking about a lot of that sounds like it's eastern culture and then you're combining with western culture what we know right so could you talk a bit about that, your perspective? How did you ever think at any point? I would just love to hear more about this because it's something that I don't know about and it's something that I'm sure a lot of people, especially people with a psychological uh, ed educational perspective in the Western field might just be like, why are we talking about chakras right now? So is there is there more you could talk about that? Okay, this is probably going to be too much in the expert lingo corner, but <laughs> that, let, me, let me just give that a go. Anyway, so I think uh, if, if you listened into one of our recent talks, we were talking about the brains, right? And, and the, yeah. the parts of the different awarenesses, um, parts of our psyche or our consciousness that have different jobs to do. Yeah, the mental, the emotional, the physical, just to give a very rough outline mm -hmm. okay so now it turns out that the chakras that have been observed in eastern cultures for thousands of years i can think i can say that safely um are actually something like like a mechanism that is built into each of those brains we are okay. still debating if it's really supposed to be there but let's just look at the status quo it's there and that's the chakras and they um, to a large extent overlap with the job descriptions of the brains of those sub units of our consciousness or our psyche. Okay. Yeah. And for those people who are sensitive to it, they can sense the energy, 
but in our Western paradigm that has been long dubbed as woo woo stuff. So um, we kind of tend to suppress the awareness of that to, or not develop the sensitivity for it to a large extent. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I think there is there is a connection that it is relatively, um, that I guess for people who might be kind of skeptical about this idea of energies and this concept, um, I mean, spiritual emergencies tend to rely on the same thing, right? When we talk about Kundalini experiences. Uh, yeah, that's that's one thing. Not I'm not all spiritual emergencies have to do with, with the chakras and energies, um, but that's one example, definitely. Right, right. No, I guess mm -hmm. what I was trying to go with with was that if uh, was it David Lukoff that he was able to classify. I forget if it was spiritual emergencies on the DSM five, which is a very wonderful kind of. I'm not like a huge fan of the DSM-5 and what it stands for completely, but in the sense that it was able to combine this idea of, you know, this concept that is more um, experiential of, you know, this woo-woo-ness of feeling hot energies and what it represents and how it manifests uh, psychologically, if you want to call it that, you know, able to kind of classify it on, on DSM-5. I think that's a good bridge. Um, so these kind of experiential experiences. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Um, is there anything you want to say, Daniel, or anything well, else? Um, the, the 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 thing with the chakras is something, um, as Inca pointed out, in other cultures, um, it is given the same as in in most Western cultures or mostly people grown up in Western cultures. It has been uh, not given. Okay, so the fact uh, the the question is now what is true and what is not true, and um, and there are certain things which uh, science might not be able to explain, and 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 the, the model of chakras might help there. Um, regarding spiritual emergencies, I highly recommend reading the book from Groff. He wrote a beautiful book on spiritual emergencies, and um, knowing from my own experience that many spiritual emergencies are simply classified as psychosis okay and then they're like uh, paranoid schizophrenia or what whatever the the icd-10 diagnosis for that is while the person um there, there is a difference okay so if, if the person is aware that that there's uh, um that something is going on okay and um, and it's not 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 normal basically so there's a function functionality in this in this way of living and I tend to more see there that there are spiritual emergencies than when the person completely lost its his or her connection to reality. But it's it's very difficult this topic, and it's it's not easy. And so if it, if it's in the DSM five, that's awesome. Yeah, okay, that's a progress. And uh, and I think we are at this time very far away from understanding our psyche completely. So we're just in, in the baby steps and baby steps understanding step by step what's what's going on and and um, each bit like the chakras might help to, to understand a little bit better where we are, where okay. we stand. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely an interesting topic. Yeah, uh, yeah, ahead. I think it's it's really, really a, a step in the right direction that um, the DSM-5 now kind of like moves away from this um, kind of like digital classification. This is healthy. This is unhealthy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that people get get a broader idea of, okay, there's a development in consciousness that can take place. And maybe that development needs a bit support to, to really bloom. Yeah. Correct. And it's yeah, not something that needs that label of cuckoo. Yeah. It's, it doesn't it's not helpful yeah <laughs> that's one thing i enjoy about reading y'all's book especially the, the the psychobiology one um the fact that you're able to take these classifications and use them to kind of move forward move towards healing and growth because i feel like right now you know for lack of the tools it 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 serves a purpose of what medical science does which is you know it helps you classify what these clusters of symptomology does but after that 
you know, we we do have some tools, but they're just not the you know we're. It seems like you guys are applying tools to actually go beyond that and and kind of resolve incomplete events that create these symptoms. Um, I see. I see that there is a question um, on the chat. Um, okay, and this is more related to peak state stuff than trauma, right? So. Um, Maybe if you guys can, I'll read it and, and you guys can explain a bit more what we talked about because I think this has to do with silent mind or with, uh, I could be wrong. Um, but it says, I want to learn about how how people spray a Borg fungus and this is possible remotely. And is this possible remotely like via a long distance, via phone, text or video chat? I am wondering how people can tell between Borg fungus versus peak state. Um, yeah, so this might be something that's beyond irregular trauma healing talk. Uh, so it might be great for if anybody's joining us, it might be like, what are you guys talking about? Um, to just kind of discuss it a little bit. Um, so take it away. All right. Well, maybe I need to rephrase that a little bit to, to make it clear what this is about or what I'm assuming this is about. Um, we, we have seen that there's one particular mechanism that's a fungal origin that um, has the, the uh, characteristic of um, going beyond the personal boundaries, yeah? So you could essentially link up with somebody else and um, actually it's what we call courting and people interact via their traumas through that fungus. Sounds a bit far off, but um, let's let's just assume that's what we found out, or at least that's the model we built from the facts that we had. Okay. Now, one of those things that can happen when this fungus gets activated is that it sprays. That can happen when you're trying to heal because this fungus is invested in not making any change in the environment of your primary cell that is where your consciousness resides. Okay. Or that's that's the model that we're using, that there's a mapping between the primary cell and your consciousness. Okay. Okay. So um, we are not teaching how to spray anything because that would be uh, a negative thing to do. We don't do that, right? In our paradigm, we're, we're not trying to harm anybody else. So we're not teaching how to spray. We're teaching you that the fungus can spray and you want to stop doing that. Basically, you stop aggravating it um, or you um, learn techniques how to calm it down or eliminate it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So All this, right. I mean, we, well, some of that stuff. Can, yeah, I, just, can, I, just, can I just add something? So to, to make sure. it a little bit. Um, so we, we usually talk about trauma and how trauma affects our, our everyday life and what we can do about it. And um, the Institute for the Study of Peak States for, I think, now almost 30 years has studied that phenomenon and, and found that there is not only trauma, but there are peak states. And that's why they called it the study of peak states. Peak states meaning elevated states of consciousness, basically when something really works well. Most of uh, you guys might know that when there's a day when just everything flows, okay? You wake up, breakfast is great, and you get to your car, and then the traffic light is green, and, and everything is just works out and flows and so on. This might just be one peak experience. So just one day of your life or just several hours of your life, you just feel great and everything is perfect. And then for whatever reason, <laughs> typically your boss or your coworker calls and is angry with you, and boom, everything is gone. So that peak experience just vanished and um, and you're back in your normal consciousness level and um, and things sometimes seem shitty or seems not so nice. So peak states are usually blocked by trauma. That's one of the big findings of the Institute for the Study of Peak States. And um, and when when you basically find the right corresponding trauma and heal that corresponding trauma, um, then this peak state gets um, gets activated. And while the Institute was studying this, um, they found several things like this bulk fungus mechanism, which um, is a very common problem in, in, in most people. 
And as, as Inka pointed out, they found what it does and then how it can be activated and how it, how it can be calmed down and actually how it can be eliminated. And one way to eliminate it, a very good way, is the silent mind process. And we've been talking about that in one of the previous episodes already. And this is just to, to give the new listeners a short overview of what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you for that both. I think um, there are two things that came to mind talking about this. Well, three actually. The first one is that I think we've all seen people um, who might be all in the same situation, yet some just the way they handle things or the way they their perspective of the world is just different. Um, and they so we might call this some people have more resiliency, right? That's what we that's how we see it. That's how we see it from the outside looking in. Just wow, this person I have a I have a I'll give you a story. I have a friend right now who's going through he's just starting med school and he's telling us how it's going. Uh, you know, just diving deep into this new process of just digesting like truckloads of information in short amount of short amount of time and just trying to do well. And everybody knows that med school can be very difficult. Um, and he seems to be doing fine. And he talks to his other other like friends that he's making, and they're all, you know, more stressed out, they're all kind of panicking. And for the most part, you know, he's just trying to find his groove, and he's adapting very quickly. And I, I think that's an example of this peak state, uh, this level of resiliency, this level of experience, this level of consciousness that some people may have that others may not understand. And I think that's one example of it, where, where the stresses of life don't affect earlier things and don't overwhelm you, don't stress you out as much. Um, so you're not necessarily, you're not overreacting, you might just be reacting or adapting to the situation in a healthy manner. Um, so he makes me think of that. And I, I, I think that's a good example of peak states. Um, the the second thing was talking about the 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 Borg, the the fungus that you guys are talking about. I mean, I think we can at least establish from a, a connection uh, from the trauma perspective and people who might be coming in and listening to this and be not really sure what they're listening to. And it would just be that uh, this is what we call trauma bonding right? This is what we call situations where we're in relationships or when we're in dynamics that are being played because our traumas are being triggered and, uh, you know, call it uh, transference, kind of transference. We are building a sort of dynamic within a relationship based on these traumas. And we've talked about this multiple times. And we've had some great examples in the past. So um, it's really interesting. The last one, and I think this is whether it's, uh, you know, uh, talking about symbology, but I'm not a big, I'm not, I am a nerd in some aspects. I'm not a huge nerd in Star, in Star Trek, but I do know that there is, uh, in one of the, one of the episodes in Star Trek, there is the species called like the, the Borg or the Borg Collective. And it is this, like, I don't know if it's related at all, or it just sounds silly, but I do find it interesting that it's this species that has like a hive mind, and they're trying to, like, all kind of become one by, like, assimilating um, kind of just each other, basically. Um, I don't know if it's related, but it makes me, it's kind of an interesting idea that it's it's out there, and it kind of is similar in that there's this connection to each other and it's not necessarily the best one. You know, it takes away from individuality and ultimately that's what we want, right? These kinds of, of symptoms take away from us a bit and, and they don't let us be who we are by ourselves. There's something else take controlling us, so to speak. Uh, Inka, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry about that. Mike was on mute. Um, yeah, actually, you're you're spot on, Sergio. I think um, Grant named named it the Borg just for those those reasons that you said. Oh really? Um, yeah, yeah. It's this this fungus kind of like tries to integrate us into its hive mind, basically, 
And at its worst, people actually use their, um, they, they lose their, their humanity really. Yeah? They become an instrument where they're just using their, their need for power um, to interact with that fungus to, to supplement their traumas and gain power over others. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, we've seen this, um, this fungus at work when it comes to wars. Yeah. This perceived difference that they are different from us. Yeah. Yeah. This, this segregating people into basically we are the right, the humans, and those are the non-humans, the not okay people. That's yeah. uh, an artifact of that for, uh, Borg um, consciousness or that fungal infection yeah, that we have for the larger part of us without okay. knowing it. That's, and in, in fact, a lot, of, a lot of psychotherapy, a lot of the problems people are battling sometimes for a whole life is just on that level. And it's really so unnecessary because that's not who we are, as you say. Yeah, that's okay. just really on a surface level. And, and the funny and interesting thing, which is might happen uh, when people watch this, um, that might get their Borg fungus activated and we get some hate comments. So um, whenever you think that you want to type in a hate comment, well, that might not be you, that might be the Borg fungus. Why? <laughs> you to do that. Because it's changed and it doesn't like if we disclose it. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, would, would it be a stretch to say that uh, since we're talking us versus them, that racism is related to this at all? Racism, nationalism, uh, hate between football clubs. Yeah. Um, ban, like, how do you call it? The um, gangs in, in, you know, we and them. Anytime it's we and them. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Anytime you stop seeing people as individuals, but kind of like put them all in the same bucket, so to speak. Um, that's where you're probably being um, instrumentalized by the Borg. How is this beneficial at all to, not to us, but to it? Yeah, we're getting really deep into the woo-woo stuff, but if you imagine fungal cultures in a Petri dish, yeah, okay. they also compete for space. And we're just their, their um, how do you call that nutritional gel that they put in the Petri dish to sustain the, the cultures that they grow there. That's what we are for them. Oh, it's a, it's a bit of a ooh, thought, but yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So the interesting, the interesting thing is that all the findings, all the psychological findings, the findings from research, and they have been created into that model of the Borg fungus. And there is a process to get rid of uh, uh, those mechanisms. So I'm not sure if there really is a fungus or not, but the model itself says it and the, uh, the tools we have to work with it also. Okay. So it's a model and right. it works. And, um, and I like that it's a little bit mystical and there is something uh, more going on and it makes sense okay this we against them is is, is something which in human history is is predominant it yeah. might have been uh, might have been uh, a benefit earlier well because there's like this 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 uh, village it's us and that's the other village that's them so you yeah. don't mix the mingle okay that keeps the keeps in stops in, uh, in infectious diseases or spreading so so in earlier times it might have had even some protective features for uh, for the human race i don't know that's just speculation but just if you if you think about it there might have been um, some some good coming from it but uh, i think from the human humanity point of view and from the human point of view um, fighting against each other and, and, and saying we are better than them or our religion is better than this one. Um, it's not really beneficial. Mm. It's really interesting, really interesting stuff. And I, I mean, I, I really enjoy talking about this because we do know that, or we talk about, for example, racism and even nationalism as taught, right? But it also had to come from somewhere. Um, 
And there are people who, even when they fall within these, let's just say, you know, places where there might be a lot of it, like a lot of racism or a lot of nationalism. And I can talk about the U.S. because we see that a lot here lately. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting how some people might not, even if they're there, they might not become, you know, fall for that. But I do always think about that. Like, where did this, where did racism start? Where did it come from? And it is an interesting idea to say maybe it came started there this this tribalism this tribal mentality this lower level of consciousness mm -hmm. and that i don't know it came from maybe what you guys are saying so it's a really really interesting topic um yeah and, yeah. and we see that the more trauma people have um the more helpless they feel and the more trouble they have to deal with that with feelings of helplessness and powerlessness the more they um, sacrifice their humanity to the Borg, yeah? The more susceptible they are to using this mechanism to compensate for, for their trauma. Are, you, are we talking about like displacement or stuff like that right now or projection? Um, not really. It, it's more like, <clears throat> how should I say? Okay, I'm going to use a very unpopular example here. I know the US people are very fond of their weapons. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they are. They are. And now I'm living in Germany and we don't like it's very rare for a person to own a weapon. We don't feel the need for it. And it's really something that only hunters, state licensed hunters and and policemen basically are carrying. Okay. So now the more you feel threatened, the more you might want to have a weapon coming from a place where you think a weapon makes you secure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where I stand, that's a fallacy because owning a weapon makes you more likely to die from violence, not less. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, so that's a bit like a person who has a lot of trauma might grab for the Borg and use, start using the Borg. And that means their consciousness intermeshes with the Borg to control others through uh, the courts, for example. Yeah. Through using their trauma to interact with other people's trauma mm -hmm. in a way to control. Um, I had a boss once who did that. Yeah. He, he was so, he was a bit of a Napoleon type um, person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very small, basically insecure, but he needed to feel a sense of his own power. And mm -hmm. he was almost consciously using people's fear of loss of job, of, um, being not good enough or whatever trauma people are carrying around to really pull their strings to keep them in line, to exert power over them, basically. Okay. How can you, how can you be conscious of that? How can you do that consciously? Like what, like, let's say somebody right now might not know they're doing mm -hmm. that and just, how would you say that? So if they listen, they're like, oh, well, crap, if, I'm if doing somebody's that, you know? intentionally intimidating people, they are using that mechanism. They know people have trauma, that the susceptibility to be intimidated. Okay. And their trauma is the need to dominate someone. And they, okay. they use that. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Okay, that makes yeah, sense. So that's, that's the coding mechanism, the, the fear of losing something and the other person is dominating. So that's what's keeping them attached and the, yeah. the fact that the, the medium of attachment is the board fungus. So like trauma yeah. manipulation, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Didn't even know that was like a thing. Well, it's a big thing. Too. Well, we there's don't, we don't recommend thing. it just to, you know, Oh, definitely. No, there's, there's a, there's a whole field of psychology using that trauma manipulation technique. It's just called advertisement. 
<laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, unfortunately, I'm part of it. Don't fire me, but yeah, it is. It, it is. Uh, it's huge. It's definitely huge, and uh, yeah, it's a shame because it, it relies on. But I mean, I don't think advertisement is necessarily bad, but the way it's used right now, absolutely, because it it is using, you know, these intense drives, and some of them just are survival, you know, like fear uh law you know a lot of it is like you know few left you know and it's it's feeding on this like these survival instincts that we have and and these early brain early brains so yeah that's really interesting i never thought about that yeah and and, and the need for uh, connection so you always see like a happy family or the need for um, autonomy so you see you, you have more than the neighbor or stuff stuff like this so advertisement and, and the psychology around it uses many of these traumas and also the, the core emotional needs which are based on very very early traumas and um and yeah and that manipulates i mean advertisement needs to be so there needs to be some information spreading around but the way it is used right now from many uh from many advertisement i don't know how you say it, producers yeah um, that is very manipulative yeah i agree but the good thing is if you know about it you can heal the trauma and you just look at it and it's just pictures and nothing more interesting wow well that was interesting as heck uh i i wanna i saw there's a question and i don't want to keep the person waiting too long uh thank you for that for that for those comments and that insightful description um uh, i hope if somebody is listening to this that if you think this is weird, you just ask questions, you ask, you know, like, it's I, I, I mean, I'm, I just started working on all this stuff. I been in, you know, I studied psychology for a long time. I've always had this intuitive th notion that, you know, if you're feeling crappy, if you are dealing through something, you're not just broken, there's something going on deeper. Um, and trauma therapy, traumatology has been, you know, trying to prove that for quite some time there is a lot of work out there we're we're talking about stuff that may be a bit beyond that and if you have some perspective if you have questions like you know ask you know it's not we're not here just to be like here you go like this is i just i don't think that's how anybody should go into anything uh i think that's dangerous so yeah just ask if you if you are taking the time to listen to us and you know just want to say Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. And yeah, if there's anything you want to ask, ask. Uh, question number two, a comment on Facebook. It says, they say, can you guys talk about healing from soul loss? I think I worked with this during my recent peak states process and it helped a lot to me. It seems like this feeling state of longing that you guys spoke about last week. Um, so that's something we haven't talked about. These are And these are very unique terms, right? That you guys... At, at the institute have kind of classified for these exper experiential things happening within us that maybe we don't uh, have words for yet in regular psychobabble. So what's, um, could you talk about that a little bit more? Could you, could you explain what soul loss is and, and you know, what, what this per what the person who took the time to, to ask this um, wants to know? So, Any, you want so to go ahead? yes, yes. Uh, so, solus is a special case. So, we talked about trauma, and there are certain types of trauma. We talked about biographical trauma, generational trauma, and body association. And uh, I think we also touched about on projections. And solus is a special case. Um, it's classified as, um, yeah, a, a missing or longing feeling for something or some place. Um, something like i'm just reading from the book because i, I don't want to miss something here um uh, like a region um uh, of your flesh is missing or you want something and never get it these are basically symptoms people might experience and um and with these um and certain certain feelings um and sensations within the body we know that's a soul loss and with a very simple tapping technique we can um we can heal that, meaning that this the sensation, the feeling, the emotion will vanish. And um, the interesting thing is with the solos, there's also some music uh, involved. So there might be some humming of your therapist 
end of view so um that's that's the nice thing about the solos and um and yeah and, and, and especially if people are in, in like a grieving process if they lost somebody um, many people experience the solos and that's actually one of the of the causes when this this grief cycle stops and gets stuck and can't process and you can't get to that acceptance phase because there's something like something really 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 big missing inside of you and um and when that that uh, solos is uh, then worked with then um, usually the grieving cycle um st start uh, uh, continues to work through and basically ends in acceptance then okay note that this is um an instance where you can still um, pick up that uh, Dr. Grant McFedrich started um, his research um, from observing some shamanism or shamanistic practices. Yeah, he's uh -huh. been looking into different um, religious and shamanistic practices to um, come up with a with a common denominator, like what do they all have in common, rather than saying this one is right or that one is right. He was trying to um, find the synopsis um, of where people are actually on track of, of an actual phenomenon that um, can be mapped here. Yeah. And uh, so the name soul loss still um, is reminiscent of that era. And also the, the humming is actually a shamanic technique, but it works. Um, I suspect has to do with the frequencies here. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, so one way of looking what we, uh, at what we're doing is we could call it a form of scientific shamanism okay. uh, without the bells and whistles. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Except here with the solos, there's these whistles and humming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, no, but but no no rattling and. <laughs> That's all that, that doesn't. What drumming. I find interesting yeah. is that you're you're saying it's pretty uncommon. Uh, no. No, it's not. It's not uncommon. Oh, okay. No, no, no. So it's pretty common. It's yes. it's fairly common, but it's it's uh, it doesn't follow the the a straightforward trauma uh, regression um, structure. Yeah. Okay. At some point, we realized okay, the the majority of trauma follows a particular structure, and it it maps with a certain structure in the primary cell again. And then there are some cases that we couldn't quite figure out why is that not following that structure until we we researched more into the mechanism of that and that's what we term then special cases. Um, and there are more or less common special cases, but uh, solos is actually one of the more common ones. Okay, so is it, is it safe to say that most of us are kind of carrying something like that? Uh, yeah, well, you could get triggered into, yeah, like, for example, when you lose a person, uh, when you find something missing in your life, um, actually, you can go all the way to depression if you're getting stuck in the soul loss, yeah. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Okay, that's that's good to know. Um, and as to the shamanistic part and the, the frequencies, that I find that particularly interesting and we can go back and talk about breath working because i think that is part of it right that uh, um what we feel sometimes uh can be actually i don't think it's too much of a stretch i think that's why we like the music we like right so there's got to be some sort of resonance with the feet the feeling that's coming in and what we are feeling you know, so if we're listening to like death metal or country or rock or a sad song or a happy song, there has to be some those frequencies, whether it's the scale, the, 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 you know, the harmonies within a certain timbre of like the instrument or your just your voice, there's got to be some sort of resonance that that hits whatever it is you're feeling and either calms it down or allows it to move forward. That is really interesting because I feel like that can be a, a, a facilitator. I feel like that can be a huge facilitator and music or just sound in general. Um, I don't feel like you need to have like these, you don't have to learn these things so much. They're much more intuitive because they're much more um 
yeah, it just comes a lot. It just comes natural for people. People love music, so I think these are things that, as that, can be catalyst to to healing. Um, I don't know much about the research, but I do find it really, really interesting. I have seen some some research on it with more visual stuff, and we talked about it. But from a emotional perspective, um, yeah, I don't know much about it. That's super interesting. So. Yeah, that's all I got to say about that. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or any anything that the, the Institute has found in terms of, of sound. Um, anything you guys care to share or any anything you guys have seen in the in that respect? No? None? Not, not, not really. That's very experimental. I, I think there is something that music and the frequency and the harmonics have to do something with it. And the in, very interesting thing is the very early and public domain version of the inner peace process can be found on the um, uh, ISPS website is done with a classical music piece from Beethoven, I don't know, one of the uh -huh. old, uh, older, uh, most classical uh, components. And um, and um, that actually, I think, from the music theory, describes the dance between a man and a woman, and that that is something also very similar to the music is very similar to a developmental event, okay. and yeah. uh, and so um, Grant used that, Dr. Grant McFedrich used that in the in the very early stages to to use it as a as a as help to get to this inner peace um, state, and it can be found on the website and. Um, yeah, so there, there is a link, um, resonance and, and the music and, and so on, but I still very researchy and experimental. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, good to know. Um, um, I see. I see an answer um, on the soul loss talk. Is that do you do you want me to read that, Daniel? I, I just asked a question to that here on Facebook, and I got another question, another another command comment. Um, I'm, I'm just posting, copy and pasting. Just okay. Um, do you mind if I read this? Okay. Um... Yeah. Um, I I just posted an answer to the to the um, person who who asked that question. Um, I, I suppose in this special case, it's more than a soul loss. Like the soul loss could have been triggered by, by the sister dying, a very sad thing and definitely a loss. Um, but then also in this special case, the person had donated bone marrow um, and basically watched a part of themselves die, which would trigger another type of trauma. Interesting. Yeah. So I suppose this one would be a combination of different yeah, things. Yeah, that sounds rough. And, and that's that's also the answer that uh, um, we got now. And um, and then we got another comment uh, on Serio with the music. And, uh, and um, the question there is, I do wonder if people get stuck in music of their teenage years and don't progress personally. Some people stay in the music from their teen years and others move forward with new music as they get older. Yeah, I've thought about that a lot, actually, because uh, I noticed I noticed a big difference between. Um, so I, I, I'm as you can tell by my my background, I play a lot of music. And before I, I always enjoyed music, uh, my my perspective coming to these talks and, and where my where I try to bring a lot of info is that I was in this sort of peak state. I wouldn't know what to call it before. Uh, I had a lot of trauma that kind of took me out of it, and I'm on my, I'm trying to get back to it, but ultimately I'm trying to just heal a lot of these things that came up. And while it's not pretty, I can definitely like give perspectives on that. And before I would, there was, you know, I was the kind of person that made playlists all the time. Like I loved making playlists, and I remember at at one point I was making playlists also like 2013, 2012, 2011, 2012, etc. And the difference, like statistically speaking, in how I made music, the amount of music I consumed, uh, 
to the one I do now says a lot about trauma for me. And I say it from a, it, it might be anecdotal evidence, but it's, it's very, it's a very, it's a thing I'm very aware of also coming from my psychological like education and stuff. I noticed that when I, because trauma gets in the way of so many things, it, one of the things that it gets in the way of is uh, curiosity and spontaneity. And I noticed that I don't take as many risks like listening to music. And that could be for a lot of reasons. I think one of the reasons is that when you have things that you're dealing with, whether it be somebody that passed away, it takes all your energy. And if you're not processing it, a lot of your energy goes there. So a lot of this positive energy or these uh, healthier expressions that are more constant, like curiosity, like uh, spontaneity, like uh, risk taking in, in the sense of maybe listening to music, that energy goes somewhere else. So I noticed like I still listen to a lot of new music, but not as much. And I, I tend to think that when people get stuck in, you know, their earlier, what they liked when they were younger, it's almost like a response to this. It's like staying in their glory days. It's like staying in the things that feel good. Um, and I think that it happens to a lot of people. And I, I also think that's why people, uh, yeah, it happens with every generation and it's going to happen to our generation. It's going to happen to Gen Z when they say like, you know, the music of our, the earlier music was so much better. This new music's trash. Like, it's so bad. It's the same thing. Like, I think it's just the glory days. And I, but I also think it speaks to the, the persons themselves. I think it speaks to the people who, it says a lot about themselves, whether it's, you know, I stopped growing a little bit in this respect. I stopped taking chances with music. And I think music also, new music you you relate to new music because it makes you feel something new or it makes you feel new stuff so it helps you grow and i think that when you're not listening to music as much i'm not saying it it is but i i definitely do think that it can be a representation of that um yeah so that's that's yeah, that's it's, my it's theory a, on it it's a beautiful model you either um, want this, uh, you have a need for these glory days back. So that's why you listen to the music of your teens or you haven't developed it. You're, you're still that, uh, that teenage boy basically inside and you haven't grown up and, uh, um, and, and some trauma. And it's really interesting say to later, perhaps if you keep these playlists that you created to look at them and then correlate them with what was going on in your life. And then from that later perspective, retrospectively looking at it to see what, what, uh, you can derive from it. I hope yeah. you still have them. No, I have them. I listen to them a <laughs> lot too, but yeah, it's just something I noticed. It's a lot, it's a bit more difficult for me to find spaces where I just listen to music and explore. And I think that says a lot about uh, where I am right now in terms of my, my inner psyche, whatever you might want to call it. Um, and, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm trying really hard not to judge here because I think it's also important to it's an it's a good measurement for me of where i want to be and you know music is very important for me so um for other people it might be other things but yeah i do find that perspective really interesting and i i mean especially because i think music is such a powerful instrument of language and emotion so um so yeah i i agree i agree with what uh I don't know if it was you or somebody else in the chat that said that, but yeah, I, I, uh, that's how I feel about it. Um, there is, there is a couple more things that I'd love to ask. Um, and we've talked, we've talked about, I don't know if we've talked about it here before, maybe we have, but I have with Daniel, um, and this is something that doesn't get talked about enough in my opinion. And it is this, uh, the perspective of dissociation. I think dissociation from different angles can be seen uh, differently. Um, you know, we, we look at dissociation and when we hear dissociation, mainstream media has dissociation a lot as uh, dissociative identity disorder, right? Multiple personality disorder. That's what we see a lot, maybe not as much anymore, but we did in the past few decades. But we, I, I saw it recently with the movie Split. Um, did you guys see that movie? It was an M. Night Shyamalan movie where this guy has multiple personalities and one is like a super strength monster. It's 
kind of insane, but it is an interesting movie. Um, I do know that Dissociation is third in one of the most commonly um, one of the most common quote unquote disorders that people deal with. I don't think it gets enough attention. And I think it is because it's still misunderstood. Um, we've talked about it with Daniel and some of the, 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 all the academic reading I've done on it is that dissociation is not so much something like what we think of as maybe anxiety or depression, although I could be wrong. I'd love to hear your thoughts, but rather dissociation and this feeling of being detached from, from oneself or the world or feeling numb like you can't connect to your feelings or feeling like you're out of your body is primarily a response to, to trauma. So it is not trauma itself. Rather, it is a response to a traumatic event or to traumatic events. Um, I know that in the Institute, you guys uh, essentially say that anything that is traumatic or correct me if I'm wrong, I think I read it in the, one of the books, anything that is a trauma technically is dissociated. Uh, and I think I'm talking about something slightly different. It is kind of the the clinical symptomology of how how overwhelm or a lot of overwhelming trauma being activated feels to some people. Um, I do find it interesting that it's not something we hear about a lot, although I have been seeing it lately uh, in that is one thing that's great about social media. One of the few things that is still great about social media and that is this uh, knowledge that comes together that we might not have heard about. And I think dissociation is one of those things. So I would love to hear your thoughts and your, you know, perspective and insights on, on this. Yes, uh, Sergio. And, um, and uh, thank you very much for that question. And let's, before we start, I'd, I'd like to look into what um, the official um, definition is dissociation is a disconnection between a person's memories, feelings, behaviors, perceptions, and or sense of self. That's what the American Psychiatric Association says. And the symptoms, um, there are five core symptoms of dissociation. Amnesia, often described as gaps in memory that can range from minutes to years. Depersonalization feeling disconnected from your body or thoughts, the real realization, feeling disconnected from the world around you, identity alteration, the sense of being markedly different from another part of yourself, identity confusion, a sense of confusion about who, really, who you really are. And I think this is a very good example to explain that um, we are here talking about the psyche, talking about uh, our soul or our inner world and trauma. And it's something we can't really see. And everybody has developed a, a way of describing phenomenons they perceive and uh, they observe. And the American Psychiatric Association has descri uh, described this as dissociation with these five symptoms. And if you look into the um, into the handbook and the subcellular handbook, the Institute for the Study of Peak States has found different names, as we discussed today, for example, SOLOS, and uh, has also found different reasons, really reasons in that psych uh, scientific model, what they uh, developed for many of these symptoms. OK, so there is not a one to one mapping of what the American Psychiatric Society says and what, for example, the model of the Institute says and what the therapist of the Institute would do with a client. OK, so um, it's true that and, and we discussed that, that uh, the Institute says that everything which is not calm, peaceful and uh, emotionally light is a trauma. And the second um, a parameter for trauma is an out of body experience. We always say that if you see the scene as in the um, as on a on a postcard, and um, and that's that's something a little bit like the depersonalization, feeling disconnected from your body or your thoughts could be interpreted. Um, and so, um, in in psychology, especially in schema therapy, 
the dissociation is is um, is a mechanism, an escape mechanism to escape the um, inner inner pressure, the inner stress, the inner uh, emotional turmoil a person might um, might experience, and um, and it said it's difficult to to work on the dissociation itself because it's just a way how we you how we react the other person other one person might react with the dissociation the other person might react with being angry and uh, running around and and so um there for example in schema therapy the um the um, the idea is to to reduce the inner stress so they say there's an out outer stage and an inner stage and the the stress is happening on the inner stage and i don't want to go to, into schema therapy but they see even in psychology it's just a symptom the uh, um, association and it's it's caused by something um internal distress internal from the institute for the study of peak states we have several explanatory possibilities um what a dissociation might be from a trauma out of body experience over a bubble over some um other things um and um and I think that that's that's a very good good way to describe the difference between different people looking at the same thing but describing it differently from their point of view and from their understanding what they what they know. I hope that helps a little bit. Inga, what do you think? Um, well, I just wanted to pick up on what you said that this uh, depersonal depersonalization um, or all the other things that you described in in the context of dissociation that's just a symptom yeah it's like i have a headache it doesn't say where it's coming from so it requires a bit of differential diagnosis to figure out what are the actual cases that we have researched that are behind it and i can think of at least four or five at the top, um, off the top of my head that could cause this kind of thing and and that would require deeper interviews and delving into it because as you said everybody verbalizes their inner world a bit differently yeah because our language isn't isn't really meant to transport that kind of experiences unfortunately yeah. uh so did you on mute right <laughs> that is one of the difficulties right for it's kind of a double-edged sword it very especially with emotions and these experience experiential things it's um hard to describe what's going on with you and try to get somebody especially when you don't know what's going on to to guide you properly when you might not you know it might take a couple of tries to to connect on what it is that's going on and yeah it's it's difficult i think it's one thing that sticks out about this though is Danny, you were saying that depending on who you are, you might have different experiences. You might react differently to these. These are just mechanisms, kind of like the headache. Um, so are you, when I, when I think about these things, I think that a specific trauma will cause a specific symptom. It seems like you're saying though, that everybody could react differently. Like we could have two people that are dealing with the same feelings, emotions, traumas in this in this instance. However, their buildup and their overwhelm could cause them to have different mechanisms. Um, I, would, I would go so far and say they could be dealing with the same outer circumstances. Yeah. And depending on their their inner makeup, they would react with different things from they just go through this and shake it off afterwards and that's that to highly traumatized and totally off the rocker yeah okay okay in in different ways yeah correct, so correct. so that really depends on um what what their outfit is that they were born with how much trauma they underwent to, during they and their ancestors underwent during the process of development so then it's safe to say that all these, or I don't know if it's safe to say, but it sounds like all these mechanisms of once you reach a certain threshold that create symptoms, uh, you can, can be seen as like a spectrum. 
like uh, depression, then maybe dissociation or anger, then dissociation, then completely off your rocker, as you said, would that be a fair uh, kind of model to, to, to think about it as if it's the same trauma? Um, I, I think we're, we're still not quite communicating here. The same outer circumstances. Yeah may or may not cause the person to react with trauma. Okay. Yeah. Depending yeah. on, you know, how they're, how they're built basically. And some few lucky ones just go through it and it's no big deal for them. They don't even experience it as trauma mm -hmm. or stressful or whatsoever, cause they, they have the um, ability to just go through it. For them, it's not a big deal. And for others, it's like it triggers all their buttons. Yeah, Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, no, I understand that. I I guess it's because... So, so is it, what I'm trying to say is that the idea of threshold here, it doesn't apply. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, just because of their different... Just something happens, holding. something at all. And the person who's susceptible to that goes like, ah! And the person who has the ability to manage the situation, you know, it's, it's, it's not even something they need to shrug off because it just, it's all in day's work, so to speak. Yeah. Got it. And, and I would like to add that this manage can be in a very functional way or can be in a very dysfunctional way, okay? Seen from the model uh, of the peak states model. Um, so um, there are many variables on how a person can react to to a certain situation to a certain trauma being triggered and that very much depends on what inca said how many how many tra what traumas are there what are the experiences and and so on and, and so i think i don't think there's a a one-to-one -one mapping or like a guideline we have to be very very individual for for dealing with the person and their stresses mm -hmm. got it yeah, I think that's, I think that's, for me personally, when we talk about these things, I, I guess it's good to know that there's a difference, it's good and bad, differentiating symptoms and trauma, right? Because some people want to get rid of the symptoms, but you have to get rid of the trauma for the symptoms to go away. And what I mean by that, I know that sounds like obvious, but what I mean by that is in the in the case at least of dissociation it's a mechanism that's there to protect you so to speak when things are overwhelming it's kind of like a free state um and so i know i know i know sometimes when i'm very 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 overwhelmed i can go into these states i can feel dissociated and it's not a it's not a nice sensation it sucks um but so i know that for me like i can talk about it from that perspective is that man, I just don't want to feel this ever again. And so I just want to heal that dissociation. But ultimately, that's a mechanism, you don't get to heal that you have to heal all the trauma that kind of takes you to that place. Um, but, but ultimately, like the goal would be for myself, particularly in this case, to not feel that ever again. And so it might sound different than healing, trauma healing and symptom healing. How how likely is that using like peak states peak states techniques for example? It seems to me if I'm hearing you right, you're basically asking to be relieved of a particular coping mechanism that isn't helpful for you. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So it's not one individual trauma; it's your way of dealing with too much trauma. That's the problem. Did, Correct. Did I get that right? Yeah. yeah, correct. And yeah. I understand it from a, like an anal analytical perspective. Mm -hmm. I understand it because, you know, it seems like that's what I got, you know, it seems like that's how at this point in my life with the t with the resources I have, the inner resources I have, that's how my body deals with it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. And yeah. you know, I, I could I could try to rack, you know, my head trying to figure it out, but I won't figure it out. It's, it's just it's it is what it is. So yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I beg to differ. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, there is something that we call a core issue interview that goes exactly into that direction. Yeah. So we create the space for you to figure out why you were actually doing that. 
Like what's your belief about yourself that you think or that your system has to act in that way? And you go deeper and you find the root of that. Oh, that would be okay. one way how to deal with this. Okay. So it's more than one way. It's, it's not just healing all the traumas that might take you to that place. It could be why you act like this or not act like, it, act like this, you know if you have 5555 traumas and you heal 5549 of them you still get one trauma that gets you to react in the same old way and we have a huge number of traumas so it might be really much smarter to go like okay maybe i can deal with individual trauma as long as i don't keep going into that dissociative state Okay. And then you go, okay, why do I need to do this? What belief do I have or what in me thinks that that's the only way that I can handle this? Okay. Oh, very interesting. I didn't know there's more than one, one way to deal with this. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of on a meta level. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay. Um, well, those are really, really great answers. I Oh, I did have a question. Um, I know there's been done uh, work done on epigenetics, specifically, I think the one that people know the most about is the mice one. Am I correct? The rats and the, the fear, the aversion to specific like food that they gave them. And that was passed on. Um, how, how many generations i know it was quite a number for rats or mice i can't remember how many generations of trauma can be passed down to you as a human being from how many generations back do you guys know is that something that you've been able to to figure out in the institute it's way way more than science these days is able to prove really yeah Okay. And that is that all stored on the primary cell? Yeah. How? I mean, it's one <laughs> cell. How is that possible? Um, how is that possible? <laughs> Basically, the mechanism is the same one as for regular uh, biographical trauma, where you have these repetitive patterns that are each of them are stored. Mm -hmm. Instead of repetitive situations, you have um, ancestral generations that are stored. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we call okay. that generational trauma. It's a super interesting model. It's in it's incredible. Like this idea mm -hmm. of one cell kind of. Oh, Jilly is also watching. Cool. She says 13 generations in tapeworms. Jilly is very good with research stuff. So. <laughs> 13 generations in tapeworms. So, and she's read the mice study as well. It was about almond fragrant. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Super Thanks, Jelly. Wait, so tapeworms have up to 13 generations. Is that what, is that what I, did uh, I understand that correctly? I, I understand. She said that there's 13 generations of epigenetic damage that's been proven to uh, exist in tapeworms. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. And since we are more complex than tapeworms, we might even do more. Yeah, <laughs> probably. It's, it's, it's a lot more. Wow. There, it's essentially, the, the mechanism does that, that does this storing doesn't have an inbuilt finite number of generations. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's really no number that, that limits this. Wow. That's incredible. Can I, that leads me to actually to another question. You just said it. You said there's a couple of lucky people that just might go through something and it could be a traumatic event and depending on their makeup, they could not even see it as traumatic. So that leads me to ask, is it due to a peak state or is it due to a core issue? Is that something that you can help people kind of achieve where they can, um, this, this type of resiliency where they can just naturally process without, you know, trauma techniques or um, 
some sort of technique to just kind of process what's going on? Are there people that just just have this innate ability or are there is that something that can be worked on as well? Um, it's a bit digital what you're formulating, you know, like you can imagine that. Um, how would I say that? Like every every possible situation requires a certain metabolic response from you to be able to cope with it. If you're not able to do that, if you don't have that metabolic ability, then you hit trauma. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So obviously there are so, so many situations every day that each one of us goes through and we don't even notice that this could be a problem for somebody else. So basically anytime you go and look at somebody and go like, what's the big deal? That means you have the ability to deal with that situation. That person doesn't and is in trauma. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so that could be so many different situations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there are these situations where you go all over the place and somebody else goes, what's the matter with you? Hmm? You know? Okay. So it's not, so it's more like everybody has that capability to some extent. Everybody has uh, this, not everything's traumatic for everybody in the same way. Exactly. Like you were saying earlier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But there's not like somebody yeah. who just doesn't need to use these techniques. Like maybe they just naturally can process a lot of things. Yeah. They, they, I have some states of, of resilience where that total number of things that don't trigger you is just way higher than in the average person. Okay. That's, that's there. Yeah. So that could that's be um, like classified as a peak state. Interesting. That's, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful peak state. Mm -hmm. Now, now one of these states and things, uh, um, Julie, thanks for prompting me there. One of the states is, for example, if you um, are one of the lucky few people that are born via lotus birth, meaning your umbilical cord doesn't get cut, but um, stays on long enough to fulfill its natural symptoms, uh, a natural, how do you call it? Um, natural function, yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the placenta is, is left to complete its function naturally. And by the way, placenta is not an organ of the mother, it's an organ of the child, something our culture still gets wrong, yeah. This wow. is all fetal tissue. Okay. So it's, it's so, important. So, 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 so when the placenta stays longer than I think it's 30 minutes, it's a good way in, in, in uh, modern medicine, they say when it stops pulsating and uh, the recommendation is to leave it on longer than 30 minutes or with the lotus uh, birth, it stays on until it falls off, which is a little bit troublesome because it might take two or three days. Yeah. Um, so, up to but, eight, but <laughs> up to eight, yes. Um, but wow. um, but these these children usually have uh, something which the institute calls a wholeness state, and they are more resilient to to these things. Another state would be the being present state, which let's go back to peak states. And there's a whole list of peak states on the institute's website, and that's the state that Eckhart Tolle has. He sees in the present moment, and in the present moment, trauma processing works differently. And um, and so if, if you practice mindfulness and practice all these things, um, do some trauma healing with it, that makes it easier. And then eventually um, you might experience some present moment and then life, life feels nicer. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know and that there is... Go ahead. I, yeah, I just wanted to come back to the, um, the wholeness state of the placenta being um, left to really complete its function. Um, it's my pet theory that a lot of the dysfunction in our society of never having enough of greed, of always needing more, higher, better, nothing's ever enough is an artifact of that um, way of dealing with our birth. Okay. Yeah. So because I, I, because yeah. The, the, the placenta, that feeling of wholeness gives you that sense of you don't need anything. You're complete the way you are. You don't need a new car. You don't need a better job. You don't need a better whatever, shape, um, partner, all the things that 
the consumerism that is kind of like built into our society, I think it has to do with the fact that we're just born with that permanent lack in ourselves. Okay, that part of us the, is taken, taken away, yeah? Don't tell the people who do who are an advertisement, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, they wouldn't like that at all. We just be here as all as like little Buddhas and not need anything. <laughs> Are, is, is the wholeness state only achievable at this point? If you were one of the lucky babies who had a lotus birth? Or is that something that the Institute is working on? Um, helping others like achieve? I know that there's inner peace and silent mind that are um, something that you guys help others achieve. Are there any other states that are achievable through any other peak states processes at this time? Um, the wholeness state is a bit more complex, really. So um, I'm still trying to figure that one out. Hopefully close. <laughs> okay. Um, once it's done, I'll invite you to come and pick it up because it's really something nice to have. Okay. Um, there, what other states are there? Sure, like there's... Um, you could work towards underlying happiness, which is another one of those um, brain fusion states. Yeah, that mm -hmm. makes like when all your your brains, your your subunits of, of your psyche are working together seamlessly. That also feels very different. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so these all kind of accumulate. It's not like you can have one and then take the other away or anything like that. You, they kind of yeah. build upon each yeah, other. Yeah, you 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 keep adding them together to to function as a whole. And, and and since peak states are just a way of your organism of your of yourself working better it's even that you can say okay i want less of this and more of this and so you can it's a functionality you have later on okay so it's it's really cool to have them okay wow that's that's interesting um to to talk about a little bit more just about lotus birth i do think it's so interesting i i have heard that i i've read a bit about it but is it is it I know that they recommend doing it for a little longer, but the four days, eight days, like, is it something you have to really kind of take care? Because I know that I remember reading that it's still, it can be dangerous for the, for the baby. Like if there's an infection or something from leaving the placenta attached and stuff like that. So are there any, for anybody reading this, are there any books on learning about Lotus birth or anything you might recommend to kind of, you know, if, if anybody's interested in this or anybody's going to have a baby soon or something like that? Um, there's one Australian midwife who has written a book about it. Shivani Connell. I have, I'd have to look it up. Gilly saying, Gilly, Gilly, I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name right. Uh, 30 minutes? 30 minutes or less? 30 minutes for the lotus birth? Okay. Uh, not quite. No, the real lotus birth is you wait until it's completely falling off. Okay, 30, so minutes 30 minutes is not a lotus birth. That's basically that's the minimum a, recommendation. A, that's, that's a slightly improved clinic birth. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Got it. That's the minimum recommendation from the Institute or like two hours. Um, and don't cut it earlier. Okay. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, it's good to know um let's see uh i think i mean i i know we usually go for an hour and 30 minutes um i do have one more question uh, uh shivam rashana rashana is the author of of that book okay. lotus birth okay uh how do you how do you spell that do you mind do you mind putting it on the chat um yeah okay just being present state okay and the, the being present state, is that something you guys are working on as well? Or so it sounds like there's underlying happiness, maybe wholeness in the future, silent mind, and inner peace, correct? Those are the ones that you guys are able to help people. Well, not wholeness yet, but. Well, the, the official peak states processes are the silent mind and the inner peace for, and then there are some more. And when you, when you, when you have achieved those and when you've gone, gone through them, the more healing you do on yourself, you will eventually um, uh, enable switch on or whatever word you want to, see, want to use um, 
other peak states and, and these peak states then are classified and then you can say oh i have the no skin state or i have the whatever state um and and that is something you usually get when you when you just integrate the healing as a natural part of your daily life and whenever something comes up you do the projection you do the body association you do the uh, generation you just do the regular tapping and um and then eventually more and more of these states will get activated okay that that was my last question um it seems like i mean there is a lot of healing going on but there is some complexity to these kinds of of um techniques so if somebody i feel like there's two kinds of people they might be able to they might show up on your your email doorstep and that is people who are coming in because they might be feeling anxious or depressed or dealing with a grieving and they might not know what to you know they need help and then there are other people who might and it could be the same people they just go hey that was great uh tell me more about what you guys do um how can you talk a little a little bit about these techniques the complexity of learning this the simplicity of learning this what does it take in terms of where you who you are what you're dealing with and maybe the importance of certain techniques, um, whether it's like visualization, which I feel like it's really important. Um, this intuitiveness, this connection to your body, like what are some things that are really important for people to kind of come in knowing about the body mind connection that would facilitate this work for them? Essentially, it's one of those things that we teach people like how to be in body and how to experience that emotions do have um, a correlate in the body, in the physical sensations that you experience in your body. Okay. So, so I think so. Yeah, that's you, kind of like the basic, basic le lecture number one here. <laughs> okay. I, th I think you're absolutely right. Um, there are typically two types of clients, the ones that uh, seek help with a certain issue with fear or depression or whatever, whatever they, they have. And then there are people who want to um, take this in as part of their life on their journey to experience themselves more and not so much what the outside conditioning uh, has been and want to um, feel better. Yeah? And the feel better part and the peak states part is, is a certain way of living. You have to over and over again, um, sit down, do some tapping, and um, then eventually you you reach these things that, like Inka said, she's working on the uh, wholeness state, and Inka is in the institute for a long time, and it, it's it's not easy to attain. But once it's figured out, there will be a process, and then people will um, get into the um, yeah will get the benefit that is there's a there's a standardized way. So sometimes there's a standardized way to get there, and sometimes it's just uh, you work on your yourself on your traumas getting to know yourself better and um and um, cleaning yourself up okay yeah that's great um yeah that's great i think that was my last question for today i think that was super these were super helpful questions um for me <laughs> and i hope for other people as well I do really appreciate uh, everything, but primarily that discussion on dissociation, I feel like while I do, and at this point, I, I, I'm very connected to the ones on the DSM and, and what, what current uh, somatic experience and EMDR practitioners, the way they describe it. Uh, but I really, really enjoyed nonetheless, some of the topics you talked about and some of the deeper aspects of why why you go to dissociation or and what can be done to kind of deal with these things um so i just want to say unless there's anything else you you guys want to talk about um for me you know i just want to thank you for your time um is there anything else you you want to speak on any topic anything that maybe got left out out of this conversation Seri, thank you very much for this beautiful moderation and um, thank you all the listeners and for the comments and the interaction with us. Uh, I enjoyed it very much and I also think it was a beautiful um, session today. And um, right now I just have to say thank you and uh, see you uh, next time. Okay, Inka, anything you want to add?
no thanks very much um that was um I, I always appreciate you coming up with interesting angles of of topics to talk about yeah thanks of course of course and again if anybody has any questions this is on facebook and this i'm sure will be on youtube uh at some point and you know chat comment ask your questions you know this is just one small side of the story everybody's got their story they have to share and you know they these guys are here to help inca and danny are great and if anything at least though if you're not sure if you don't know much about this they'll at least provide you with some some answers some research like inca just talked a bit she just posted something on lotus birth um so yeah always reach out that's what we do this for for more you know more information and to make you feel more hopeful and like you have more control over what choices you have in terms of healing and growing so i just want to thank everybody for the time uh is it gilly or jilly i'm sorry <laughs> one more time is it gilly jilly jilly it's jilly good. jilly thank you so much um who else i think there was somebody else earlier but i can't it was, see that it was rose rose uh rob if i'm not mistaken yeah um if there was anybody else i missed i'm sorry I, I can't see the comments right now for whatever reason but thank you so much for your time and you know until next time take care guys until next time thank you bye okay thanks bye bye, bye daniel bye inka bye sergio